in the swirling currents of our oceans, nature's ultimate shapeshifters thrive. Masters of disguise, octopuses embody the wild magic of the sea. Today, we're plunging into their world where every tentacle tells a story of survival, adaptation, and wonder. Welcome to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Today, I am joined by David Scheel, PhD, an acclaimed professor of marine biology and author of Many Things Under a Rock, The Mysteries of Octopuses. David has dedicated 25 years to studying these incredible cephalopods. We dive deep into so many aspects of octopuses' lives, including their behavior, intelligence, social lives, conservation status, cultural significance, especially in Alaskan indigenous communities, and the scientific questions he and his team are working on today. We explore why he felt inspired to turn his decades of work into a book, and I asked him several questions based on my top takeaways. I can pretty much promise that you will walk away from this conversation with a newfound appreciation for these eight-legged creatures under the sea. Before I forget, if you're loving what you're hearing, don't be shy. Hit that subscribe button, leave us a review, and share this episode with your ocean-loving pals. Every little bit helps spread the conservation love. All right, enough from me. Let's dive into the magical and mysterious world of octopuses with the one and only David Scheel. Well, hi, David. Thank you so much Hello. for sitting down with me, you know, all the way from Alaska um, in your very, very busy time. Um, but we have so much to cover and I am so grateful and honored to be speaking with you today. So... I have to ask this question first, before we get into anything deeper or all of your knowledge of everything you could have studied, why did you choose octopuses? Well, I just kind of fell into it, I guess you could say. Um, I mean, probably the immediate reason uh, that I kept going as opposed to why I started was... Uh, that it, they're just captivating animal. And so it, um, I, I work at a university that focuses on undergraduate education and they wanted projects that undergraduates would be interested in working with. And so I had already done a tiny bit of work with the octopuses and it seemed like that would be a reasonable one up here in Alaska uh, to help keep undergraduates interested. Oh, yeah. The, originally, I got started on it um, because I, I was living in Cordova at the time, Cordova, Alaska, on Prince William Sound. And um, that's one of the towns that was um, not in the path of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, but heavily impacted uh, by it. It was one of the main harbors where fisheries harvest went to. And um, so I worked in Cordova and people there... Um, the Alaska natives harvest octopuses as part of their subsistence harvest. They're sort of uh, native cultural foods from the land and, and the water. And so there was some interest within the native communities about the octopus population and whether it had been harmed by the oil spill. And so I, I wrote a proposal to look into that some years after, after the oil spill itself. And so, and, the reason why we sat down, um, we're sitting down today, is I've had the privilege of reading your phenomenal book, like um, Many Things Under a Rock, The Mysteries of Octopuses. Like, wow, I feel so much more educated about this incredibly unique group of animals that I just didn't, I just wasn't even aware or knew of um, exactly the mysteries of, like the, the title of this is perfect. So what about them? makes them so unique. Why are they so different when we look at them fundamentally, biologically, um, behaviorally? Like, why are they so, yeah, why are they so unique when it comes to um, our, our living animal kingdom world? Yeah, well, I, I think that people tend to have a, 
a particular view of of the of the animal kingdom, right? And and part of that view is uh, the the closer it is to us, the more interesting it is, right? Mm -hmm. So like chimpanzees are fascinating because they have societies, you know, they recognize one another, they form form friendships, they form enemies, uh, they fight they fight battles, which are somewhat like wars. They use tools. Uh, and there are nearest, some of our nearest living relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. And so, you know, that's fascinating. And so if we accept that that's, you know, sort of the basic attitude that people have about animals, one of the interesting things about that is just the flip side of it. Like if animals that are closely related to us are interesting, then does that mean animals that are distantly related to us are boring? Is that really kind of the flip side of that? And so I think when we go to something like um, that's not even a, it's not a mammal. So, so, you know, no furs, no, no lactation, no nursing mothers. Um, but then it's not even a bird or a fish, which have spinal cords. It's a, it's an invertebrate animal that whose body layout is very distant to our own evolutionarily. And so what I think what makes the animal so interesting to us octopuses is that we kind of don't expect them to be interesting, but then we find out they're just as complicated and intriguing and, um, uh, you know, uh, specialized in their own way as any other animal, including as the chimpanzees. And so it's fascinating to see not so much how, how weird and different octopuses are, but how often they confound our expectations, which is kind of a problem with our expectations rather than a property of the octopuses. Um, you know, they, they've got some amazing capacities, but part of what makes them amazing, only part, but part of what makes them amazing is we just don't think we're going to see that kind of thing in an invertebrate. And I, yeah, exactly. Which I would love to get more into like the, their biology and what makes them so different. So I'm sure by this point, after researching them for 25 years, you know, you've had this beautiful career with them. You've written a book. You've talked to lots of people. What, from your opinion, what is the most misunderstood or underappreciated aspect of octopuses that you think that you've, you've encountered over and over? Um, you know, I get three, two or three really commonly, I get two or three questions about octopuses that are, you know, just by the fact that those are the questions that are out there might, might represent some, something that, um, is misunderstood about octopuses. One is simply what's the correct plural and we're using it. We're talking <laughs> about them octopuses. Um, you know, some people use other plurals and, and, uh, depending on your take, they all have interesting histories, but most people just want to know which one's correct, which is in my mind, it's octopuses. Uh, the ES, octo and pus both have roots in ancient Greek language, Greek language. And so the, the plural that we use in English that has roots in the Greek is the ES plural, octopuses. And so for that, that kind of works as a, a package of how we bring Greek language into, into American English. Uh, a, another question that's really common, um, maybe is, is how, how big do they get? I, I work on a species called the giant Pacific octopus. And so, you know, we can imagine that a giant octopus must be pretty big. Uh, and it is in the octopus world. <laughs> um, they, they routinely do reach sizes around 100 pounds or so. Um, and wow. there are some records bigger than 100 pounds that as you get bigger, I think if you look closely at the records, they sort of become increasingly questionable. Uh, there's one that's pretty solid at 156 pounds. Uh, and then there's some that are above that, uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm still not certain that we can rely on them, but they're definitely out there. People will see them. 
Wow. Yeah, 100 pounds. Like, that's absolutely incredible. Yeah, that's, yeah Just, and, and, and over. So that can be as big as a person. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. So next, I would love for us, um, let's dive into, like, the natural history of octopuses. Because a lot of us listening might not actually understand what they are. So maybe could you just give us like an octopus 101, what qualifies as them? What are some fundamental aspects that, that makes an octopus an octopus? Um, and is there anything that we should be aware of that, that almost back to my previous question that shouldn't be associated with them? But yeah, if just, just give us an octopus 101. I would love to learn from you about what these amazing creatures are. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, octopuses are cephalopods, which is, you know, another group that maybe people are still learning about. So within the cephalopods, you have sort of the squid, cuttlefish, bobtailed squid, things like that, uh, octopuses, and uh, the nautilus also, as well as some extinct forms. And the cephalopods as the whole group they're one of the major branches of the mollusks. And the mollusks include things like bivalves, clams, and scallops, the gastropods, which are snails and garden slugs and, um, and uh, nudibranchs, sea slugs, and the chitin is another major group of the mollusks. Uh, and so they're the, the, the cephalopods with the are one of those big groups of the mollusks and, and they're um, ex exclusively marine. So they only live in the oceans. Uh, and what sets the octopuses apart from the other ones, probably most simply is that they have eight arms, whereas squids and cuttlefishes, for example, they have eight arms plus two tentacles. And so it's mm -hmm. that absence of tentacles uh, that defines the, the, um, the, the group of octopuses. There are a few other things, but th th that's an important uh, distinction. Um, the tentacles are these sort of appendages that are very specialized for uh, capturing prey. So in a, in a squid or cuttlefish, the pair of tentacles will sort of shoot out and grab the prey. They might be preying on fish or something like that, that has a very fast escape velocity. So they have to sort of grab it before it has a chance to respond. Uh, and then the eight arms of the squids or cuttlefish, those are used to handle the prey. And the octopuses forage on the bottom, mostly. So they're mostly bottom feeding animals. And so they don't need that rapid fish catching, if you will, uh, prey handling apparatus. They don't need those extra two appendages. And so they do their capture as well as their handling with their arms. Yeah, that is super interesting. And one and another aspect about them that you wrote quite extensively about was their social life. Because I just, just maybe my ignorance previously, I didn't realize that there was, you know, these the like truly social um, octopuses. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about that? Their, their social life. Um, are there solitary ones? Are there more social ones? Um, how do they interact with each other? In th There are about 300 species of what we consider shallow water octopuses, not deep sea. Um, 300, well, more than 300 species uh, that live on the sort of the coastal uh, shelf, the ocean shelf. And... Um, that that's a lot of diversity 300 species means that different yeah. octopus species are doing different things and there are a few species of several of which that i wrote about in many things under a rock where we find octopuses interacting and they kind of have this reputation as being completely solitary animals partly that comes from the fact that they they do often live solitary lives, but it also comes from the fact that the, the bigger ones are known to eat the smaller ones sometimes, so they can be cannibalistic. And that can happen particularly 
uh, I don't know, uh, in a particularly spectacular manner when a smaller male is trying to um, convince a, a larger, to court a larger female and get her to mate with him. And so if the female's hungry and not in a mood to mate, she might eat the male rather than mate with him. So we have this sort of background idea of octopuses as mostly solitary and kind of hostile to each other, potentially cannibalistic. And so in the last, I don't know, maybe 20 years or so, people have gradually found more and more of these examples of octopuses that have these interesting non, I don't want to call them completely nonviolent, but much less hostile than we expected social lives. They're not based on the, the, the mother offspring bond, like in chimpanzees, in humans, in African lions, um, even in uh, you know parrots, for example, a lot of what happens socially is built on the mother offspring bond because all of those animals really care for their young as their young are developing and learning and growing up. And so there's a lot of pair bonding behaviors that can be used to strengthen the mother offspring bond but then can also be used and are recognized all across the species because everyone was an offspring at one point to sort of have parallels in other kinds of relationships. Octopuses don't have that. The mothers lay their eggs. They take care of their eggs very diligently. But when the eggs hatch, at that point, the mothers almost always die. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, but for the most part, Octopuses don't have this mother offspring set of behaviors on which they could build any sort of sociality. So we see a very different kind of social interaction with octopuses that seems to be based more on getting to know your neighbor. And, and so uh, I worked in a, in a location in Australia, in uh, Jervis Bay, with uh, gloomy octopuses. And there's some particular conditions there that allowed many dens to be located in one very small area. And that area, that small area, is in the middle of a lot of octopus food. It's in the middle of a scallop bed. So it's easy to find food. It's hard to find shelter. And the only shelter you can find is right next to other octopuses. And so now you've got to cope with your neighbors. And so a lot of what we see in, in octopus interactions is something brings them together, and then they sort of have to evolve or, or develop, I should say, or learn ways to cope with one another. And they do it in all the same sort of ways that you would see um, birds and mammals coping with one another, or a lot of the same sort of ways. They uh, signal to each other. Uh, they may have chemical sensing. No one's very sure about that. A little bit like smelling. Um, mm. They defend their own den. Um, they probably, but we're not certain yet, learn to recognize other individuals and come to know what to expect about them. And, and so I think these, these sort of neighborly social behaviors are rooted not so much, like I said, in... Uh, as they are for mammals in parent offspring behavioral uh, sequences, but maybe more rooted in uh, dealing with other species in their lives. Mm. So if we think about what an animal needs to do to survive, right? Uh, an animal needs to be able to recognize its own food. It's got to recognize its prey, right? And then uh, it also has to be able to distinguish that from its predators, things that are risky and dangerous. It has to be able to recognize threats. And then a lot of what goes on in the world is neither edible nor dangerous. And so there's this middle category that an, every animal has to learn to recognize, which is things that um, might bear looking at again, but are not immediately a threat or an opportunity. So in doing that, pretty much all animals have to 
in their brains, they have to be able to have categories. They have to sort things into types, tasty, risky, or neutral. And for almost every animal that I've ever looked at, there's categories of tasty, right? Uh, it might be a fish that's going to flee very quickly versus a crab that's going to scamper away versus a scallop that's going to swim rather clumsily away. And so you need different ways to attack those. Those all might be possible food, but you're going to chase them or pounce on them in different ways. And so not only do you have to recognize sort of three categories, animals have to recognize a lot of different categories. Well, what else can fall into categories? Other members of your own species. Is it a potential mate? Is it a potential rival? Uh, is it somebody you don't need to worry about? And so I think that's what the octopuses are doing in these places where they interact a lot, is they're drawing on this ability that they already have in their brains to categorize things. And they're applying it to their own species and saying, okay, this octopus is my mate, that octopus is my rival, and that octopus is my annoying neighbor who always shoves her den cleaning over into my den. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it seems to me the underlying theme here with what you just talked about is uh, octopus's intelligence. And I know you you wrote, that's one of the things that just really opened my mind reading your book. And then also there seems to be more and more documentaries just explaining how intelligent that these creatures are. And I would love to go into that a little further. How exactly do you as a researcher and scientist measure intelligence? Have you done any interesting like experiments where just to figure out how we would quote unquote rate their intelligence? And if so, what might those be? Or it has it been all in the field? And what can you conclude about octopuses intelligence levels? Yeah. One of the interesting things about working with intelligence as an animal, my field of study is behavioral ecology. I, I study animal behavior. And so when you're dealing with intelligence from the perspective of uh, a behaviorist who studies multiple different species, is that you have to ask yourself, is the question you're trying to ask to measure intelligence a question that your study animal can understand, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're going to talk about human intelligence, we can maybe make an IQ test. And if we make that IQ test carefully, it will measure something about the ability of that individual to uh, manipulate information, solve problems, uh, have background knowledge, et cetera. But we are looking for specific things. We're drawing on specific kinds of background knowledge. We're drawing on your skill at solving particular kinds of problems. And we're doing it all, of course, with words. And animals don't have words. And so one of the things that, that is, is probably a truism in the field of animal intelligence is every species that we have with us today is intelligent enough to do what it needs to do. Right. So in some ways, when we talk about animal intelligence, we're really asking, what can they do that animal that we as humans think is really smart? Because they all do really smart things. They're all smart enough to uh, survive or we wouldn't have them in the world with us. Um, right, right. Right. So, you know, when it comes to sort of measuring how smart an octopus is, this is one of those questions that gets asked all the time that, um, you know, doesn't have a, a firm answer. But here's some of the cool things octopuses can do, right? They uh, do something called one-shot learning, which is they learn very quickly from an experience. They have one experience and that kind of, that's what they learn from. Okay, either this object is interesting and it's manipulable and I can explore it some more, or maybe I learned that it's very hazardous and I should stay away from it, right? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, they don't necessarily need a lot of lead time to learn. 
and that can um, that can make it really challenging when you're uh, getting to know an octopus, for example, or trying to develop a new experiment with an octopus. Because if the first trial goes uh, differently than you had hoped, or the first encounter is a little rougher than you had imagined, then that octopus may not want to have much to do with you anymore, or not much to do with the oh. experimental <laughs> apparatus. They're also very good at figuring out um, what else can we do with this thing, right? So how can I break it is, is kind of the major octopus question. Um, and if you think about it, their food that they have to get into to stay alive often comes encased in a very hard shell. Like a, imagine a big butter clam, you know, like a four inch clam tightly clamped shut. And if I give that to you and say, can you open this? You're going to have a hard time, particularly if I ask you to open it with just your hands, your major, the major thing you use. Without a tool, without a knife or a hammer or a rock or something, it's pretty hard to open. If I give it to an octopus, that octopus is not going to give up for a long time. And that octopus is going to use a lot of different methods in its toolkit to get into the uh, into the clam. And I wrote about this in Many Things Under a Rock. I wrote about how, you know, they can try pulling it apart, sort of brute strength. Maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. Uh, and then they can try um, uh, drilling through it with uh, the radula and the um, salivary papillae. And then if that doesn't work, they can also just uh, try chipping at the edge with the beak by, by kind of biting at it. And so they, they have this repertoire and this flexibility to try one thing after another after another. So imagine if you're trying to teach an octopus a trick, like reach into the tube, pull the cord, and then you can open a door and get at the crab over here, for example. They can learn that trick, but they're not done yet. They might also mm -hmm. want to know, well, what happens if I pull harder at that cord? What happens if I bite more at that tube? And so many, many times when you're trying to do an experiment with an octopus, they're busy finding ways to break the, uh, break the tool, you know, and see what happens, <laughs> see what happens when it comes apart. Oh, that's super fun. That, uh, I just, I had a flash of memory through my mind when you were saying that, especially just how, you know, like for some reason, some octopuses have that, just that one shot memory of, didn't you write about where there was this one octopus that really liked, is it your daughter, but for some reason didn't like you and would shoot water at you? Am I remembering right? That's two different octopuses, but you are remembering. Oh, okay. There was one octopus. Uh, it was one that we kept in the lab and, and in the aquarium, in the lab, I do most, I do behavioral research. And so we're trying to get the most natural behavior out of the most healthy octopuses we can. And I have a team of students that takes care of the octopuses. And so we needed periodically to weigh uh, octopuses. And um, so one time I was showing the students how to get the octopus into a mesh bag so that we could then pull the mesh bag up, weigh it, and then put it back into the water. It only takes a few seconds, but some octopuses react pretty vehemently to being coaxed into the, wet, the mesh bag. They don't like it. And this octopus didn't really want to go into the bag, and so I kind of had to do a little jiggling and a little pushing of arms and things to get it into the bag. And then we did the weighing and we, we released her. But ever after that, she did not like it. <laughs> And so she was perfectly happy to play with the other, uh, other caretakers. But if I walked into the lab, she would squirt water out of the tank and try and hit me in the face with, with it. Yeah. So, you know, I wasn't always popular. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Um, and I, I would also love to learn more about just, just on this intelligence um, idea of like outwitting, outwitting rivals or predators. How, how do they do that? Um, that they're like taking in their surroundings and able to like 
it's just just reading your stories here of just how they just disappear. Like you could be watching them and somehow they just completely disappear. I would love to learn more about that behavior and, and how they either come to that conclusion or how it works. Just all of those things. I, could you just teach me more about that outwitting uh, camouflage behavior that they have? Yeah, so... The octopuses are really good at a number of different things, uh, but but notably hiding in plain sight. Their skin, the, the camouflage that they can put on their skin is, is very uh, dramatically successful in the sense that sometimes you can be looking right at an octopus and totally miss it uh, unless you catch, for example, the, the rows of suckers, the edges of the suckers, or, or the, the eye itself. And they use a number of different tricks to do this. The first is they use uh, uh, body uh, skin patterning. So they're changing the color of their skin in different blocks, not, not sort of all at once, but um, they can be uniform. They can be uniform dark or uniform pale, but then they can also put on sort of a very blocky, um, contrasty kind of body pattern in which... Um, uh, they, they might have a, um, a pale stripe down the mantle and then dark patches on either side of it and then uh, banding down the arms, for example, uh, that really breaks up the body outline. And it makes it hard to follow the edges of the octopus because our eye, the vertebrate eye, is drawn to the edges of dark and light. And so if the octopus changes where those edges are by making different parts of its skin dark and different parts light, it changes where our eye looks and it, it changes how we follow form so that we just can lose the octopus entirely against the background. And the other thing the octopus can do is, is they can pick out a particular object in the, uh, in the environment and adopt sort of the, not necessarily the exact color pattern of that object, but put on the same size of color spots, the same granularity, if you will. And so if you've got a gravel bed and the gravel pieces are, you know, a half inch in diameter, the octopus will put on a sort of a modeled pattern in which the, uh, the, the patches of dark and light are approximately the same size. Whereas over a bed of very, very fine gravel, that was very, very small, like sand or just big coarse sand, the same octopus might go to a uniform color that matches the average intensity of the gravel. And so what happens is with that sort of just color change alone, you lose the octopus against the background. But they can also change their body texture, the texture of their skin. And so like if you've ever seen kelp in the Pacific Ocean, like North Pacific Coast, California, um, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, it's very wavy. And the octopuses up here erect these um, uh, folds in their mantle that run along the length of the mantle that have waves in them. And they look like <laughs> the edge of a kelp blade. Um, Amazing. But, yeah, in the tropics, the octopuses will erect these little bumps and papillae that catch the, the sunlight, which the water is much clearer there and there's a lot more sunlight. In the tropics, they erect these papillae that catch the light in the same way that uh, the coral heads catch the light. And so and when they're sitting on a coral, uh, you know, a couple of feet distant from you, they look like the edge of the coral. And then the third thing they can do, so they have, they have color patterns, they have skin texture, and then they have body posture. So they can put their arms up this way and that and look like different things. And so um, some of them will mimic just a little clump of, of algae that's broken loose on the bottom and it's just rolling along the bottom in the waves. And an octopus will put its arms up so that it kind of looks like a clump of algae and then just sort of walk along the bottom at the same pace as the waves. And can they see colors like us? Like if somebody, if another octopus is looking at that kelp and they become the same color or texture, can, are they also seeing it like we do? Or do they have a different way that they view the world? 
Yeah, they don't see, they do not see color, uh, at least as far as we can tell. There are a couple of theories out there that suggest ways they might see color, but no one's ever established those. And the way an octopus behaves, they, um, they don't behave like they can see color. Um, mm. But what they do is they fool the vertebrate eye. They fool the, the eye of their predator or the human eye or a camera. They fool us into thinking that they know the color of things. But they're actually only matching background intensity, lightness or darkness, and particle size, right? The thing I talked about, whether there's big, big patches of light and dark, then they'll have a very disruptive patch pattern on. Small patches of light and dark, um, then they'll have a very mottled pattern on. Or very, very fine patches of light and dark, like in sand, then they'll just match the average. So they're seeing that intensity and that particle size. And then our eye, which is very color-based, our eye reads that as color matching, even though they, they're probably not color matching at all. There is one other trick that the octopus can do with color, which is sometimes it can reflect it. So they have a layer of cells called leucophores that are um, sort of disperse the average wavelength of light. Uh, wait, leucophores and, yeah, anyway, they have a layer of cells that will reflect or disperse some of the available light. And so if they're in an area like an a eelgrass bed where the predominant light is green because the incoming light is the only wavelength that isn't being absorbed by the grass is green light. And then that green light is being reflected out. And so anything that's down in there is basically seeing green light, the octopus, rather than absorbing that green light, can open up this layer of cells that's more reflective and reflect green light. Not like, um, not like a mirror or the scales of a fish, but uh, nevertheless, it will tend to look green under those circumstances and be a little harder to spot. Wow, they're just they're just absolutely incredible. Like reading all of, I mean, we, we wouldn't have time today to go through every single like amazing adaptation that they have because they do have quite a lot. Like I just felt every single page of your book. I was like, I'm learning something new every single page, every word, um, which is just incredible. Just how much you've learned about them. And I did want to make a shift here. So, one big part of your book and how you actually started out quite a lot. There's a big cultural aspect to octopuses that I wasn't aware of um, that you beautifully went into depth in, especially when it came to like indigenous cultures and indigenous stories. So why did you feel like it was important to include these stories from indigenous cultures up in Alaska and other areas? And maybe could you share some of those what are these stories um, and, and culturally that the octopus has played in these um, cultures for what millennia, a very long time? But yeah, I would love to learn more about them. When I started studying octopuses, I didn't know anything about them either. And, and so I did a lot of reading. I knew science. I knew how to do science at that point, but I didn't, I didn't know anything about octopuses. And so I had to do a lot of reading about them. Um, and one of the first concerns that I ran into, my, my plan was to put a team of divers underwater and capture octopuses. We wanted to count them, but we also wanted to know how big they were. And we also wanted to be able to assess their health and see whether they were, whether they were healthy or whether they had unusual growths or you know, any sort of problems like that. And so we needed to put divers underwater and capture octopuses. And, and as I've already mentioned, the species that I was working with first was the giant Pacific octopus, which is the largest species of octopus in the world. And they can get well over 100 pounds. And there are records um, that I am not sure, less well documented, that are much larger. And so one of the first concerns I had was just how big can these octopuses get? And so if you start reading stories about 
looking for how big can an octopus get, you immediately launch yourself into the realm of B-grade horror movies, uh, yeah. giant monsters, and uh, you know all kinds of legends and stories in all different cultures about uh, sea monsters. And so one of the tasks I had to do very early on in my studies was separate um, fact from legend. And I was doing all of this in Cordova, uh, which is at the site of the, of the um, last native Iac village. Um, and I was also there at the time that the last native EX speaker uh, alive lived in, in Cordoba. And so this preservation of, of native culture, this sharing and passing on of Alaska native culture was very much in the minds of everyone who worked in, in that world at the same time as I was trying to sort of separate out, you know, monster stories and legend from scientific fact. And you know what? That's not really how uh, indigenous people see the world. You don't really see a sharp distinction between legend and fact. They represent their understanding of the world in story. And they keep it going through generations by keeping those stories alive. And so telling stories is part of, as I understand it, how indigenous culture survives. And of course, storytelling is fairly universal. Um, but this sharp distinction between established scientific fact and legend is not universal. Um, and, and so one of the reasons that the Alaska Native stories are in my book, uh, Many Things Under a Rock, is because I wanted to sort of honor the way things unfolded in my actual career, which is that I was trying to sort these things out as I was learning and studying octopuses. And I also wanted to um, keep some of that failure to make a distinction alive in the areas where it seemed to me that particularly even from a scientific perspective, we couldn't really nail down the facts just yet. Um, and so you see that uh, pretty strongly in the chapter where I, I sort of ask, how big are these animals? And as I said, this was pretty important for me to decide because we were gonna ask divers to handle them and we needed to know how to, you know, if you're gonna ask diver, if you're gonna ask a person to go underwater on life support, uh, um, equipment, uh, scuba equipment, and capture a wild animal that weighs 100 pounds, you better know what you're doing, yeah. right? I, yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't ask someone to go and wrestle a 100-pound cat or a 100-pound no. dog, you know? And so we really wanted to make sure that we were being safe and that we knew what we were doing. And, and I've also mentioned that the, the largest size of the giant Pacific octopus, easily above 100 pounds, but there are higher records that shade very gradually from science into legend. And there's no sharp barrier where you could say that one's perfectly well established and the next one is completely legend. It's like they get increasingly less well documented as the size goes up. And pretty soon you're like, well, that might be true or it might have been storytelling. And so I kind of liked that perspective. And, um, and that's why uh, the book has a lot of that uh, indigenous perspective in there, some preservation of storytelling where I, could, where I had permission to use the stories, some preservation of ideology in the sense that maybe the stories are telling us something about the world, even if it isn't you know, a, a matter of fact, uh, scientific piece of knowledge and also preservation of sort of the way this unfolded for me as a developing scientist trying to figure out um, how to do this. Yeah. 
And after having those conversations and learning these stories, um, and it, like as you wrote in your book, like actually meeting with these people from these cultures, did it change your perspective at all? Were you fundamentally different, at least for your perspective on um, octopuses after having these experiences? Well, I think in in some ways I was kind of open to that message in the sense that I've always enjoyed the quirky and the things that are a little bit outside of the norm. But yeah, you know, I, I learned a lot from working with Alaska natives and, um, you know, this, it's, it's easy to learn from people if you, uh, keep your mind open to what they're trying to say and why they have the perspective that they are presenting to you. And I think that's very true of, um, encounters between cultures as well. Uh, you know, that, that if we keep our minds open to what the other culture is trying to say and why they have the perspective they do, then maybe we have a lot to learn still. Yeah, I and mean, definitely those stories, uh, they changed me. Like, I thought they were just absolutely beautiful to have such pretty stories just cr like about a species that I knew nothing about. So I definitely appreciated reading about them. Um, and also, I think a next big looming question that I think that we all want to learn more about is uh, the conservation of octopuses. Um, I think we all are pretty aware that they play a vital part in our, you know, marine ecosystem food web and even, you know, people eat them as well. So what is, I, and like as you said, there's over 300 species, so it's kind of hard to have a blanket statement, but maybe could you at least talk a little bit about what is the conservation status of this group of animals? How are they faring? How are they not faring? Um, have you seen things change in your career? Just, yeah, what's going on today with octopuses? Yeah. Well, several of the big challenges to octopuses are the same to everything in the ocean right now, which is that we have uh, climate change is warming up our oceans. And as the oceans warm up and as we put more CO2 into the, into the atmosphere, that carbon dioxide goes into the oceans. And when carbon dioxide dissolves in salt water, it makes carbolic acid. Um, and so that means that the oceans are gradually becoming more acidic. And as that happens, it really changes uh, the physiology, it impacts the physiology of a lot of different kinds of marine life. And we're already seeing this in some of the most extreme examples where um, animals that grow shells, which are dependent on depositing uh, calcium carbonate, uh, which is v uh, that depositing of calcium carbonate and it's re and it's dissolving, it, it's depositing or dissolving into the water is very dependent on the pH of the water. And so in areas where we get unusual warming events or unusual acidification events, we're already seeing that animals that have to grow those shells are not doing very well. And so far, the accounts that I've read about that have been sort of local short-term events, um, but we're pushing that, we're pushing the oceans closer and closer to that edge where those things become not just local, but regional or maybe eventually global. Um, Octopuses don't do very much with deposition of calcium carbonate. They eat animals that do that, right? Crabs, clams, all have those hard shells. The um, bivalve shells, the clams are more calcium carbonate. The crab shells are different, but they still have some deposition of calcium in them. And then coral reefs and habitats, a lot of the habitats that octopuses use are um, made of calcium carbonate. And so even though octopuses themselves don't deposit shells, they're dependent on habitats and prey animals that do. And then as the oceans warm up, one of the things we see is that shifts the balance of how nutrients are distributed in the ocean and how productive the oceans are. And so uh, when cold water can come up from the bottom of the ocean, and cool the surface, that's when we see the most mixing, the highest nutrients, the greatest productivity. 
And uh, global climate change, global warming can interfere with that, that circulation of nutrients. And so, for example, I think we're seeing fewer and fewer uh, giant Pacific octopuses up here in Alaska in the shallow water, in part because uh, it's been so warm lately. And so as the, uh, as the waters warm up, we might see fewer giant Pacific octopuses uh, in the areas where I study. I think we're already seeing that. We might also see um, uh, more common octopuses in, in England, for example, in the North Atlantic, pushing nor north, further north into the English Channel as things warm up because the conditions at the south part of their range might be getting too warm, but the conditions at the north part of their range, uh, the, 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 it, it might be previously it had been too cold and now they're moving up into those warmer areas. So we're going to see some shifts in where the population is at a maximum. And then uh, the other big thing for octopuses, well, two other big things. One is um, uh, pollution. Uh, we throw bottles, for example, into the ocean. We put a lot of construction material into the ocean. Octopuses can use those to make dens. And they seem to like some of our trash. They love to use beer bottles as barriers or beer bottles as dens, depending on how big they are. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's sad to say, but there are some areas near big cities where um, a trash from boaters is one of the most visible signs of human pollution to scuba divers on the bottom of the ocean. You come across areas where People like to party on the surface and they throw their beer bottles over the, over the um, side thinking, well, it'll sink and, and it won't be seen anymore. And it won't be by the boaters, but the scuba divers will see it. And in those areas, you often you can find octopuses because they can use those as dens. So that was one of the other two big ones. And then the, the, the other uh, big one is fishing. We had a lot of harvest. Mm. Uh, harvest octopus predators, that might cause octopus numbers to increase. But if you harvest octopuses themselves, uh, it's very easy to suppress octopus populations by harvesting. They can't grow as fast as we can catch them. And so in some areas you see depressed populations. Uh, the good news there is if you stop fishing locally, temporarily for short periods of time, a few months, the octopuses will start to come back. And so, you know, I wrote in Many Things Under a Rock, I wrote about uh, Villandriake, the um, management system that was put in place by uh, people in Madagascar to try and preserve their octopus yeah. fisheries by rotating closures. And so this idea of just giving the ocean a break, giving the octopuses a break, and let's have a period. If you fish a lot in one area, then take a break and don't fish for a while in that area. And, and fish somewhere else. And then when you come back, the area that was previously uh, rested will be reinvigorated and better able to support harvest again. And is there anything that has happened recently or trends that you are excited about or hopeful for marine conservation or octopuses? Uh, I guess specifically octopuses, or if not, uh, like marine conservation in general? Well, I think generally um, people are very excited right now about octopuses. Weirdly enough, social media has allowed, you know, people to share little arcane things that they might see that they're excited about. And those things can suddenly bloom into a worldwide interest. And so you know, the few of us who over the last couple of decades have been interested in octopuses has expanded into a worldwide interest in octopuses right now. And so I think that speaks very positively for, for people that we find uh, the rest of the world very interesting, um, including octopuses. And I, speak, I think it spe speaks well for octopuses that they are continually captivating. They're very fascinating to watch because they don't move the same way humans move, um, but, but they have enough, they have these big eyes that we can kind of identify with. So we feel like we're, we can make a connection with them and they're just, they're, they're perpetually interesting to watch. 
Uh, they're graceful. Uh, they they're changeable, very changeable, um, and they do. They're very active, and they do interesting things. So when octopuses are up and running about, it's um, it's it's very captivating, and I think that speaks very well now to this moment right now in history that we have a lot of interest in octopuses. We um, find them endlessly engaging, and we love them, and so I think we're seeing a lot of sort of movement to make sure that they're they have places to live and that their their habitats and environments are healthy. I mean, you're completely right. Just the number of fascinating documentaries I've seen about octopuses. It's just, it's like out of nowhere, they are on everybody's radar. <laughs> yeah. When as before, they, they, they just weren't. I mean, maybe some people, people would go to like an Asian market or um, a restaurant, there'd be like octopus on the menu. But outside of that, there really wasn't much exposure to them. Um, but I, you're right. I've definitely started to notice a trend as well, which is very exciting because they're so important for our oceans. And since you're at the forefront of octopus research, what do you think is on the horizon? Are there uh, particular questions that you're asking or other labs are asking that will help us understand these animals better and maybe even have better conservation? I just, yeah. What, what questions are you currently asking about these incredible animals? Well, I think one of the important things to do is, is get more, um, more cameras underwater looking at octopus pop uh, behavior in ways that is, uh, undisturbed by the, the research. Um, you know, one of the things that we, if you, if you read uh, many things on the rock, one of the things you notice is that a lot of the stuff that we know about octopuses that's so captivating and interesting is kind of new. And I think the reason for that is that for most of the planet, we don't encounter octopuses every day. You, you might see birds every day but you don't see an octopus every day. And um, it's only now that aquarium technology that can bring a little piece of the ocean into the land and camera technology that can take the ability to record video material underwater, that those two technologies have been developing so rapidly over the last couple of decades. I mean, look at GoPros, they've been around 15 yeah. or 20 years, and they've completely changed how much video um, we can record. And we can take those right underwater now. And it's those kinds of changes in underwater photography, underwater sampling, and in aquarium technology to bring bits of the ocean into places that are far from the coast. Those two things together are allowing us to see octopuses in ways that we haven't ever seen them before. And so um, scientists are increasingly able to get to octopuses that we never would have seen before and get at behaviors that we never would have seen before and capacities and abilities of the octopuses that we haven't seen before. And I think we have more to learn about what our octopus is really doing underwater. And where that leads us, I don't know. It might lead us to re-understand how social behavior it has evolved in the animal world and give us a better understanding of how humans and human nations, for example, can relate to one another. It might lead us to understand better how the ocean supports the ecology uh, across the entire planet. Um, it might lead us to new medical techniques with gene manipulation. Um, that uh, we can learn how to do because we can see how octopus physiology is able to edit their own uh, genetic machinery. And so um, we don't really know what we're going to learn, but um, you know the signs are that we're going to learn all kinds of interesting things from uh, camouflage to social behavior to um, you know physiology. Wow, so it sounds like your work is not ending anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> as long as there's funding. Right. 
that's always the big question right in our field it's yeah. like just who's supplying the money where's it coming from <laughs> well you know um i i do want to point out that uh um you know if you've uh, if your listeners are interested in octopuses, you mentioned briefly my daughter, Laurel. Uh, she was um, with me in making uh, PBS uh, Octopus Making Contact um, and uh, the same documentary, a video documentary about octopuses. The same documentary is released by the BBC under the title um, The Octopus in the House. And then as you mentioned, there's the book, Many Things Under a Rock, which is now out in paperback, and there will be a young readers edition out early next year under the same title. Oh yes, that's so exciting, and I will make sure I have all of those links in the show notes because that just sounds fantastic to both read and also watch your work. And that's so cool. It's with your daughter too. You know, that's just like oh, that has to feel so good. It's really nice. Your, and, your and daughter Laurel was uh, in addition to being in the documentary with me. She is the artist who drew uh, the artwork for Many Things Under a Rock. Um, and she will be, there are a few new drawings, not a, uh, not a whole new set, but a few new drawings that will be released with the Young Readers edition for people who like her artwork. It was a real pleasure to work with, with Laurel as an artist on the book because <laughs> Laurel grew up with octopuses. I mean, she, uh, she was born, you know, after we were already doing the work uh, on the octopus project. And so she grew up with octopuses. And so it was fascinating to ask her to draw them for me, because with most artists, they, they have amazing technical skills, much better artists than I am or will ever be. But I would have to guide them and provide a whole lot of guidance about how to represent movement and, and tension in the octopus body because they had never spent the time watching an octopus. But with Laurel, we would just talk about the scene in the book and she would be able to draw the octopus the way it actually would be without a lot of coaching because um, she'd grown up with octopuses and had seen them her whole life. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, I mean, and and the there's so much that I got out of her um, her images as well. Like the one where the tentacle is like trying not going in the tube oh, where it's like, no, yeah, no, yeah. I'm not just, it's just, it's like, ah, it's just visually. It's like, I completely understand what she was going for. Like, that's like when I was picturing it in my mind, like it was spot on. Um, yeah. So I definitely, I love her artwork throughout the book. And so just, just how cool and rewarding. And also too, I just want to take a moment. Um, if, if people want to learn more about, um, your work or learn more about octopus themselves. Cause some of us really love to just like geek out on these kinds of things. Where can people go to maybe more get a more scientific background um, on, on, yeah, on octopuses. I, I do maintain a webpage, alaskaoctopus.com um, that has links to uh, most of my scientific papers about octopuses and links to other news coverage of that work. If you don't want to read the scientific papers, but you'd like to know uh, the basics of, of what happened and why it was interesting. Uh, all of that is represented there. Um, people can also go to, uh, you know, some of the uh, Octo Nation, for example, runs a lot of um, good octopus information. Octo Nation is uh, the, world's, the, octop the, the world's largest octopus fan club, I think is their tagline. Well. Yeah. And then <laughs> uh, there are two octopus books in addition to uh, many things under a rock that I'm always happy to, um, to recommend uh, by my dear friend, Cy Montgomery, uh, the soul of an octopus, the soul of the octopus by Cy Montgomery. And then uh, Peter Godfrey Smith's book, um, Other Minds, The Deep mm. Origins of Consciousness. And both of those are, are great reads. Yes, those sound amazing. Yeah, I will definitely make sure that all of those links are in the show notes for anybody that might want to read more. And of course, I will have all the links to many things under a rock, both uh, hardback. I have the hardback version, but it's really cool that you also have the paperback out now too. So if anybody wants to read more, 
Um, again, it's, it's both. It's the cultural side. It's also uh, deep in the science as well as your journey with the octopus too. So yeah. um, again, David, thank you so much for one, writing this book, teaching me so much about this amazing group of animals and then teaching everybody listening. I sure appreciate your time. Well, thank you for having me on Rewild, Rewildology. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on this wild adventure today. I hope you've been inspired by the incredible stories, insights, and knowledge shared in this episode. To learn more about what you heard, be sure to check out the show notes at rewildology.com. If you enjoyed today's conversation and want to stay connected with the Rewildology community, hit that subscribe button and rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. I read every comment left across the show's platforms and your feedback truly does mean the world to me. Also, please follow the show on your favorite social media app, join the Rewildologist Facebook group and sign up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter. In the newsletter, I share recent episodes, the latest conservation news, opportunities from across the field and updates from past guests. If you're feeling inspired and would like to make a financial contribution to the show, head on over to rewildology.com and donate directly to the show through PayPal or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. Remember, rewilding isn't just a concept, it's a call to action. Whether it's supporting a local conservation project, reducing your own impact, or simply sharing the knowledge you've gained today, you have the power to make a difference. A big thank you to the guests that come onto the show and share their knowledge with all of us and to all of you Rewildology listeners for making the show everything it is today. This is Brooke signing off. Remember, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>